cool. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we talk about manliness. Yeah. That. <laughs> but first, an icebreaker. Something, something, before we get into the serious topic of masculinity and performative masculinity, um, just something relaxing. What is one album you would listen to forever? Like... This is because this was your idea. Yeah, without a doubt, this would be the Symphony Metallica album. Um, I know for some of you purists out there who think that I need to only limit myself to early Metallica, um, no, I'm perfectly <laughs> fine with this. This is actually the first album that I got introduced to about Metallica. Um, I was up at summer camp, somebody had a burned copy of it, and we were listening to it, and I came home, and I was talking to my stepmom, I'm like, yeah, have you ever, like, there's this one song, it's like, Enter Sandman, and stuff, have you ever heard of this band <laughs> called Metallica? She's like, yeah. There comes a time in a young man's life when he listens to Metallica, and it either, he either brushes it off, or it changes him forever. Pretty much. Uh, but in this case, uh, I do, I do actually favor the symphonic, um, accompaniment that goes along with it. Okay. Um, I've always thought of heavy metal as being an evolution of the symphony in terms of some of the, like the, the instrumental complexity that goes into it. I'm not saying other music can't be, but uh, I, I, I naturally see that direct connection from um, symphony and sure. sol- soloing and whatnot into heavy metal. So when you beef up, so to speak, an already beefy sound like Metallica, it just works really well. Michael Kamen is the... Um, the composer who uh, wrote all the accompaniment and uh, conducted the concert, and so uh, it's a double album. I mean, if I had to limit myself to one disc, it would be disc one over disc no, two. Albums are albums, but yeah, if the entire Symphony Metallica. I mean, I have the album uh, on CD. I have the DVD copy of the concert. Wow. Um, yeah, no, I went all out on that one. Um, yeah, it's just if I, if I had to listen to one album for the rest of my life. It would definitely be the S and M uh, Symphony Metallica concert. Nice. Uh, I almost went with uh, Legion of Boom, by Crystal Method, mm-hmm. uh, which all, which dates me, but that album hit me at just like just the right time of life. I really like it. It's it's a big part of my workout music. Um, and then I realized that actually I would have to go with Gordon by the Bare Naked Ladies, which. Is the first album I ever bought. I bought it on cassette. And I listened to that thing non-stop. Because there was something about. The sort of. Diversity of styles of song in there. That really talked to me. And uh, still do. I still play songs from Gordon in sets. I still. Uh, love the Bare Naked Ladies. Like. It is. And, and, and a whole ton of their like. Hit singles. Came out, came off of that album. Seriously, try just try getting Brian Wilson or uh, If I Had a Million Dollars off the radio in Canada. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. It can't be done. Take an act of God. I don't even remember the first album I bought. I know the first album that I requested. I'm almost positive it was Hanson. I asked for that to be purchased for me, but I don't remember the first one that I bought. Hanson. Hanson. And my first concert Impressive. experience. Impressive. My first concert experience was Britney Spears. Actually, I, I can't I can't really say much because my, my first album I think that I requested was New Kids on the Block. Mm. So, um... Our relationship with masculinity is complex, is what we're saying. <laughs> um, so today we wanted to talk about masculinity and maybe use this as a seed for some other podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to, I think, talk intelligently about it, we need to first talk about it as it relates to us and how we perform masculinity in our lives and how we sort of understand and interpret or don't uh, interpret masculinity in that kind of way. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is sort of talk about individually uh, how, how we are manly and then describe how the other person is manly. Because a lot of masculinity is performative and you don't really notice it until you're doing it or when you're doing it. You're like, this is... It's like... What did I talk about in the pre-show? Hipsters. Oh, yeah, hipsters. It's like, if you, if you accuse somebody... I mean, hipsters sort of a, 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 you know, three years ago thing to throw around. But mm. if you if you, you'd accuse somebody of being a hipster, they're like, no, these are just things that I do. They are things that I do irrespective of whether or not they make me a hipster. Mm. Um, and masculinity works the same way, but they are... 
performative in the same way for that culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference being that being masculine actually has real life consequences and being a hipster kind of doesn't. Mm -hmm. So who wants to describe, we never decided who would go first. Should we <laughs> rock, paper, scissors for it on the podcast? Uh, I mean, Loser goes first. I guess I can go first. Okay. Um, this was probably the hardest podcast for us to uh, flesh out because mm -hmm. I, I imagine Jim's frustration in talking to me was a lot like the hapless idiot um, who isn't aware that, oh, I don't know. I didn't say you fool once. No, you did not, but I imagine you were thinking it plenty of times. Ah. I, guess, I, guess, I guess maybe it'd be like trying to convince a fish that they swim around in water, that yes. water exists. Um, so it's very difficult for me to wrap my mind around this because it's something that is so second nature to me. I don't think about, but when people talk to me about masculinity, there's often in my mind a distancing of, like, there's other people who try to tell me what it means to be a man, and then there's the way that I kind of act and behave in the world. And in my mind, there's a schism there that I don't know quite how to break down. Um, be Are you as swift as a coursing river? Uh, I'd like to be. I'm not, All right, so I lumber like a bear. All right. Uh, force of a great typhoon. Uh, I would be closer to that than a swift river. Strength of raging tiger. Yeah, I mean bear is more likely closer to me. Mm -hmm. Mysterious. Well, like, that is the dark side of the moon. That's that's all in the eye of the beholder. That's <laughs> it. how mysterious I am is really in the eye of the beholder. I'd like to think of myself as mysterious, but I'm probably very transparent. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, well, what does it mean to be masculine? Uh, I don't know, like, Jim described me at one point, I'm probably skipping ahead just slowly, I'm among the most masculine men that you know. Fact. Which, when he said that to me, kind of struck me... Or in struck, in it, fact, I'll go one further. The only people I know who are more manly than you are people you have introduced me to. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense, I suppose. Um... It, it's it's just such a strange it was such a strange concept that gave me pause in terms of what does it mean to be manly um, because when Jim's trying to when Jim was just was trying to talk about it to me the way I saw it as he was explaining it to me was he was describing a set of constellation or a, a set of traits or a constellation of traits and then mm -hmm. drawing a circle around it arbitrarily and calling it manly and my reaction to that is okay if that's what you say is manly I'll I won't I won't argue the point. What's what is your point, kind of deal? Um, so, like, what does it mean to be masculine? I, I don't know. I I, um, I pride or pride. I prize certain virtues above others. Um, the the big four that I tend to gravitate towards are um, uh, strength, courage, mastery, and, and honor. Um, I tend to. Uh, devote myself more towards physical strength, uh, just in virtue of being a large guy, and I have a job that relies on it. Um, I am, I, I, I have a beard. You pointed out that I have a beard, but I have, a, I have a reason why I have a beard is I don't like how my face looks from here down because I see from here down as the huckle face, from here up as the bosec face, but the beard kind of masks the huckle. <laughs> facial bone structure. You could wear a mask like shred. I, I could, or the shadow. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's not that I hate the huckle face or whatever, it's just when I look in the mirror, I see my aunts and uncles ah. um, when I when I see my baby face. Um, so instead, I, I have a beard, and I happen to look good in it. Um, when we were, we were going for lunch today, and I told Jim about the story of uh, man feels, because there's always this idea of, um, men don't have emotions or there's man feels and, and I, I apply that to myself facetiously but I remember or I, it, it stuck in my craw and I've been thinking about this for about a week um, because I didn't just start applying man feels to myself because I don't believe men have emotion or men don't have emotions there's a very specific reason and I remembered it finally mm -hmm. um, and this had to do with uh, a time when Sarah and I were watching uh, Broadchurch and the opening, um, the opening inciting incident that gets the story going is a child. I don't know if they jumped off the cliff or they were pushed because I never finished the series, so I don't know if the child committed suicide or was murdered. 
<laughs> so it's it's kind of oh it's the the net result is the kid is on the top of this bluff and then is somehow at the bottom of the bluff. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sarah was really sad by this, and it's not that I wasn't sad or that I wasn't celebrating it. It was mm-hmm. just it didn't really do anything for me. I mean, I didn't know the kid. I didn't have any emotional connection to him. I acknowledge that death is sad, uh, child or children dying doubly so, uh, but it didn't really move me emotionally. Um, and so she's, she looks at me and she's like, you know, like, that's sad. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's sad, but it doesn't really do anything for me. Like, if I knew the character more, maybe. If I had a personal connection, maybe. And she looks at me and she goes, like, are you a monster? And, I, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe. It's just it doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. But then she and I were talking about the things that do move me. And, like, Bruce Willis dying at the end of Armageddon gets me. <laughs> and, and in the West Wing, when uh, President Bartlett, after being shot, calls Leo over and gives him a, a tender kiss on the cheek and pats him and says, everything's going to be okay. Like, he's the one who's about to go into surgery for being shot. And he's trying to console his friend that everything's going to be okay. Um... Oh, another one. Uh, Spider-Man, the second movie, the Raimi movies, uh, just after he manages to stop the runaway subway car, Mm -hmm. and he passes out from exhaustion. So first of all, he passes out from exhaustion, which for me is like, it hits, it's like, it gets me going. The waterworks are welling up because he put himself in the line to save everybody else. And he passes out, and then everybody catches him and brings him back, and he doesn't have his mask on, and they're all looking at him, they're all like, they, there's this recognition in the uh, crowd that, you know, this young kid, no older than the average, you know, like the average person's child, is the one who's putting himself in front of this scary monster, Doc Ock, and mm-hmm. you know, like, they all recognize that it's this young man who's, who's putting himself in danger for them, and like, that's all that gets me going, and then he wakes up and he realizes that he's been exposed, but they're all like, no, 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 like, we're, it's okay, we won't tell anybody, it's like, oh, like that, and then the crescendo, the crescendo, Doc Hawk shows up, and they none of them have powers, and they know that Spidey is, you know, beaten and, and, and tired and whatnot, and they all willingly are willing to stand in front of, of Spider-Man to protect him, uh, and to, to, you know, like, we're going to stand up for you because you stand up for us. It's like, oh, whoosh, might as well get the tears going. Um, what else? The fire scene in, in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when the four turtles are around, they're meditating, and the, and the the essence of Splinter shows up, and he says, there's nothing more I need to teach you. You have all come together. That's all I wanted. I love you all, my son. It's kind of like, oh! Like, it's just all of these moments. These are the things that that resonate with me on an emotional level. And, so, and Sarah now kind of jokingly will poke fun at me at that but she, I, I suppose she respects me enough that she doesn't like make fun of me for it I, I will actually poke fun of you that's you fine for that. because that's every fine. single thing you, you, you describe uh, involves one involves entirely male characters yep um, two it, it it always involves struggle yep and almost every one of those examples involves violence yep I mean, the, even the Ninja Turtles, the thing that they're ready to do is go and fight Shredder. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, at the end in, in that one when they're like, this guy knows where, where uh, Splinter is, and they go charge him. And it's like, the oh, the, we were soldiers when, when uh, they're getting ready to take the hill. <laughs> They're getting ready to take the hell. And then Mel Gibson's character looks around and he tells him to fix bayonets. Because they know when you fix bayonet, you're going in hand to hand. There's nothing left. There's no distance. There's like nothing. You're going to go and you're probably going to die. So he tells him to fix bayonets. And then the music starts off that kind of... Uh, it's not Amazing Grace, but it, it was one that was written for the uh, movie. And then it just goes really solemn as they all clip on their, their bayonets for the final charge. And it's like, whoo! But anyways... <laughs> You could do this all day. I like, probably could for I somebody could. who's like, I don't really, I don't really interpret behavior as masculine. Like you just, see, you just manned it, out right so that's there. That's the thing. It to me, it doesn't register as inherently masculine. It just, it's just um, bravery, courage. Dear listeners, if you don't think that that was masculinity, please leave a comment. No, absolutely. We'll we'll, we'll decide this with like a straw poll in the uh, in the again. In the show notes. It's it's there's a division in my my mind of. Okay, it happens to be masculine, but so what? But anyways, so the, just to round off the story before I start telling more of these moments. Um, so I, in light of that, I started to apply the term man feels to myself. And when Sarah and I will be watching a, a movie together, 
And she'll look over at me, and you can almost, I, I could hear her, like, she would say probably, like, man feels, and I look at her, and I just be like, like that. Like, that's the, that's now the in-joke in terms of man feels. So it's not that I don't have emotions, <laughs> it's apparently I have emotions towards the inappropriate things. Well, I'd say, I don't think it, <laughs> so, so, um, I also have, have feelings at all, at all of those scenes, and I don't think it's inappropriate, um, to have emotions mm-hmm. at those scenes. But there are lots of other kinds of uh, emotionally provocative scenes or images. I mean, everything from... Uh, I mean, now, now I'm like trying to think of my own examples of like <laughs> alternative feels, and now that I'm on the spot, it's really hard. Um, <clears throat> but no, I will also I tend to well up at uh, moments of, of, of extreme tenderness or kindness. I do, uh, yeah, that's not to say that I don't, like, if you have an example, I can maybe say whether or not I've, I've connected with that. Um, I found after, um, after being in a long-term committed relationship that, uh, tender moments between partners will mm-hmm. sometimes affect me or, um, you know, like one partner having to leave the other one, you know, like death or something like that. Like that'll, that'll resonate with me because it's something that gets applied to to my own mm-hmm. experience. Uh, prior to that, I didn't have it. It's it's much in the same way. Uh, if I want to become a paramedic, I'm aware that a lot of times paramedics who have to treat children are often heavily affected by it. Mm-hmm. But that's probably usually because they have children of their own, so they they see their own child in the the pain of their their patient. So like up until I have children, if if I ever have children. Um, that that might not resonate with me as opposed to after the fact maybe it will I don't know like I've never had to treat a child it's different I, I'm only speculating at that yeah. point so I'm not saying that I don't have emotions to everything it's well, just like in movies like with senseless deaths and whatnot or uh, deaths that the, unless I have a connection with the character typically don't resonate as strongly as Splinter and the Turtles the final charge you know, anything like that. Oh, man. Um, so I've, I've kind of danced around a lot in terms of masculinity, but the, the truth is, is I have a hard time thinking about it because one of the things that has now informed my concept of masculinity um, was actually a conversation we had before we even started filming podcasts. Yeah, we were, this was we were like at, three or four years yeah, ago. Yeah, we were at the Walper one time, and I don't remember what the conversation was, but you had challenged me on the idea that something was inherently manly. And, and, I, and I went away from that and I, and I reflected on it and I realized that there were a lot of the things that I took as inherently manly were not necessarily inherently manly maybe men gravitated towards it but there's nothing in and of itself that said that this virtue is masculine alone hmm. culturally it might be you know like we might I don't know military tends to be uh, thought of in masculine terms even though women are a part of the military right women so, have only been part of the military for you know, going on the last like 60 years though like the military for thousands of yeah. years has been is is steeped in masculinity, and even mm-hmm. now, uh, women and LGBT people and mm-hmm. things like that they're only permitted in the military mm-hmm. so long as they play by those rules. Yeah, and there are like new there have been numerous like countless problems with mm-hmm. that. No, and the point I'm trying to make is I guess the the first step in breaking that that tradition or that history is to recognize that it's not only men that can serve in the military. Mm-hmm. I mean, whatever you feel of military action regardless, but, um, and so a lot, I reflected on a lot of things and realized that there was a lot of stuff that I engendered and defaulted to masculine that really didn't need to be. Um, and, and so I don't know where the shift happened, but it, the reason why I think that I have a hard time thinking about it in terms of masculinity is because I tend to think about these virtues and these things as they apply to me, and I'm very, very hesitant to try to prescribe how men ought to be, or to describe how other people ought to behave. I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't hold opinions, you know, um, but in terms of what it means to be a man, I have a harder time answering that. I have, I know what it means. To me, in terms of how I want to be or the kind of person that I want to become, um, but I don't cash that out consciously in terms of, of masculinity, and then that's where our our huge conversation pre-show uh, launched into is, you know, like just because I don't think about it this way doesn't mean that it's not. Um, 
and that's I guess where my blindness, my privilege in some sense is mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm not forced to think about it that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we live in a culture that is essentially sorted by masculine terms. Yeah, where people are expected to play by masculine rules. Mm-hmm. Um, my relationship with masculinity is somewhat more complex. I am typically um, not very masculine, you know, in the in the sense of growing up with, and especially growing up in contrast to people who are. So people who are interested in, uh, I want to go with sports, activity, dating. Um, like when you, when you are the, the nerdy dude, you're not really into any of these things. You're into books and D&D and you have a, I, have, I, I grew up with and I still have a lot of sort of social anxiety uh, that I, I've gotten better at managing. But it means that even things like courage become very hard to grab. Um, but they, they're masculine norms. Mm-hmm. As, as, as a man, you are expected to be certain things. Um, and when you fall short in that, men will let you know. Um, they will do so by um, by teasing, by shaming, by ostracizing. Um, there are all kinds of things. I spent most of high school uh, hanging out with like two dudes and like twelve women, uh, and it was a much cooler scene. <laughs> but and only as as an adult, uh, um, as my as my sort of cir- social circle balanced out a bunch. But. Uh, I have always been one of the girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a bridesmaid in a friend's wedding, which was amazing and wonderful. Uh, about a year ago, I started wearing nail polish, which super codes me as um, not being masculine. When I was in university, I really sort of struggled with the, the notion that I didn't. I get learned. I, I read a lot of gender theory, and you know, sort of struggled with the notion of, of like you mentioned that that people socially construct these these circles but all of those circles are socially constructed that doesn't make them not real mm-hmm. i mean other things that are socially constructed include but aren't limited to language mm-hmm. and there are consequences for conforming or not conforming or the degree to which you conform and having been on the receiving end of some of those consequences and have having also unfortunately been on the delivering end of some of those consequences um, tends to uh, like may have made me have to think about it a whole bunch and how how am I performing masculinity in different settings uh, whether it's like when I'm at a nonprofit committee meeting or I'm out at a bar with three other guys or I'm out at a bar with, you know, friends versus coworkers, and how those sort of sort of norms stack up. I I always say that in university I, I struggled a bunch with uh, my gender identity, uh, and I did I guess, but I, until I realized that what I was really struggling with was patriarchy. Uh, I don't really have a lot of gender identity issues so much as I have issues with the way that people prescribe my gender to me, and that's a and that's not a a gender issue that's a feminist issue so i mean now i'm sort of deeply i think less performatively masculine than i used to be just because i like it better i don't feel i, I don't feel bound up in it and i'm in a position where the the, the social con- consequence to it is essentially negligible um like if people, I, I think I talked about when I did my nail polish tutorial over my on my channel, where there will be guys who give you a hard time about wearing nail polish or about wearing makeup, and those are simply people who aren't worth talking to or dealing with. Like they they're they are not worth your time. I say that, but when I went to uh, America. When I, when I went to Convergence, I debated all morning before I left. I was like, am I going to paint my nails when I go to the States? Like, this is the smallest of things, and I'm going to be in a really sort of tight, safe space. A kind of like 3,000 people who are in costumes, 
Um, you know, it's super queer inclusive and I'm still sitting here going, but I'm going to have to cross the border and drive like 17 hours in the States. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. And the answer was, uh, what's the loudest color I've got? And I wore it anyway. Was it blue? Uh, yeah, it was this sort of brilliant blue that I'm wearing right now. I would have chosen something different than a loud to describe that. <laughs> it's, the probably, loudest, I, it's the loudest color I have. I don't have a lot of colors with nail polish. I was going to say, I, I probably would have chosen, like, uh, like, I don't know, fluorescent orange. I don't have a fluorescent loud. orange, You need man. to get a fluorescent orange, then. Listen, I'm not going to... I'm saying TARDIS blue doesn't strike me as very <laughs> very loud and, and aggressive in that regard. It matches my shirts better. <laughs> it does, yes. But... Yeah, it's so. My my and my my relationship with 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 masculinity, sort of on the whole, is typically deeply hostile. Like my experiences with it have been hostile uh, growing up and as an adult, um, because I will watch people marginalize other people in the name of masculinity, and. I don't know how to be okay with that. So, when I, when I, and, and you have been on the receiving end of this a number of times, when I sort of perceive someone as, do, as being performatively masculine, I will call them out on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there are ways to do that that, are, that, that don't involve uh, masculinity, and, and, and which has a tendency to become toxic. So, that is sort of how we identify our relationships with masculinity. But briefly, emphasis on briefly, uh, how would you, how how would how would we describe each other? Like, and that's where the performative thing comes in. Is that it's all the bits of manliness you do and you don't notice, um, or that I do and I'm not aware of. Uh, you don't have to go first if you don't want. Well, I might as well go first. But... Um, because I, I can keep it brief. Like um, my, my comments, I think, were summarized largely in the Slack in terms of... Because um, what I said in the Slack seems to gel fairly coherently with what you've just described now in terms of... Um, actually, now, how, how did I frame it in the Slack? I think I described you as... Uncomfortable is the wrong word. Jeez, I wish I could almost pull that out and, and look at the Slack, but it's probably so far back in the podcast discussions. Um, <laughs> yeah, uncomfortable is the, the wrong word that I, I think I would lead it off with, but in terms of um, self-conscious or self mm-hmm. uh, or con- conscious of um, intentionally displaying it outwards, um, mm-hmm. you are... You question what to put forward, what not to put forward, um, and you distance yourself from aggressive masculinity. I don't want to go all the way into... Obviously, you distance yourself from toxic masculinity, but you don't really... like You, you get along with anybody, it seems, um, or at least... When our circles <laughs> when our circles overlap, you tend to you tend to get along outwardly with everybody, um, and but you don't. Um, you tend not to gravitate towards those kind of aggressively masculine things. Like you, neither of us are really all that into sports. Neither of us are really into. Um, I really enjoy pro Mortal Kombat. Okay, esports, but. but... But yeah, like in, in terms of, of physical sports and what they mean and, and things like that, you're right. I enjoy playing them, but yeah, I don't enjoy watching them. I don't really care much for professional uh, Olympics. Might be different, but mm-hmm. that's the, that's me. That's not you. Um, so I, I don't I don't really know how to go to too much more because you've already, so to speak, polluted the well by telling me that you know like it was really you're raging against the, the patriarchy. <laughs> I am I am typically raging against the patriarchy. Yeah, but your your um, concept of masculinity tends tends to be uh, bound up or at least uh, informed by that struggle in terms of yeah uh, identity. I'd agree with that, and I think that uh, I think part of that has to do with. Um, so I grew up when I grew up, it was it was just my mom and I, and uh, a, a sort of series of of uh, shithead boyfriends for a while. Um, but 
it in, it informs me in the sense that uh, people don't typically feel safe around aggressively masculine people. Uh, the exception being other aggressively masculine dudes. And as someone who is accustomed to not feeling safe around those people, I am not okay with being one. Uh, so if I were going to describe your relationship with masculine, you did hit a lot of it. Like the man feels uh, thing really, I think, picked out uh, a bunch of it. Um, but I would also, I would also follow up. Like if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about typically mas masculine traits, then it would be uh, things like the emphasis on reason over emotion and the prioritization of it. Mm -hmm. um, which, if you would like to see Hawk prioritize reason over emotion, please go and review. Literally any of our podcasts <laughs> ever. Yep. Um, in the very first podcast, you talked you talked about your your birthday ritual, mm -hmm. um, and you, and you you talked about suiting up, and the sort of the the notion of suitness and the maintenance of suits is a very very masculine thing. Mm -hmm. Um, because suits don't just convey formality; they convey power. And they, especially in a, in a sort of patriarchally constructed world, um, a group of men in suits, uh, like the society that you're part of, uh, conveys a whole lot of masculinity in like this really tight package. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of um, performative things that, that go on in that. But uh, that said, I mean, I like you anyway. <laughs> you might be bordering on a shithead, but I like you anyways. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, that that is another masculine thing to do, though, is is to is to um, sideline feelings by by talking down about people, mm. um, which is what I just did, um, and what you just joked about. Um, rather than, than, than talking frankly, which is that regardless of whether or not I am made comfortable by all of the performances of masculinity that you show, I know that you are a person who acts with dedication and distinction and who cares deeply about people. Um, and those are things that I very much admire. So. Blush. <laughs> <laughs> it's, isn't that what you do? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Frantically beat my chest. <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure you're as strong as a raging tiger. Well, maybe. You're pretty strong. I put that music in the background of this, but Disney would sue the crap out of us, so we're not going to do that. But we will put a link to it in the show notes. Even if we both admit, well, at least I can't speak for you. I love the movie Mulan. Like, it's such a great movie. I've only ever seen it once. Yeah, so I, I've seen it a bunch of times, and I love it as a movie. So Disney, don't sue us. We we love your movie. <laughs> I like I like that movie. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to use this as a lead into talking about toxic masculinity and sort of what that means in the broader sense. And uh, and we'll put some reading material on that in the show notes as well. As sort of, but if you want if you want to encapsulate toxic masculinity. Um, I would call it the masculinity of uh, entitlement, the, masculin the, the masculinity of risk, and the masculinity that uh, uh, of sort of isolation. I wrote a post on this a while back about mm -hmm. bro culture. Mm -hmm. Um sort of as a, as a correspondence piece to a Vice article about bros. Mm -hmm. But it's that notion that um, toxic masculinity is dangerous. I mean, if you want to see examples of toxic masculinity gone wrong, um, go take a look at, uh, you know, any guy in the past 50 years who shot up a room full of women. You know, in Can even in Canada, uh, we had the Montreal Massacre. That was about 
Why do I not remember how long ago it was? I wanted it twenty uh, ish. Well, I thought it was twenty five. I thought we just hit twenty five not too long ago. Uh, you're right. But um, there are there are lots of more recent examples. It was 80, 88 or eighty nine. Yeah, yeah, because it was when we were kids. Yeah. Um, there are lots of more recent examples. Uh, there was a shooting in California last year, two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even even in shootings like Charleston. Um, even in shootings like Orlando, mm. there, the 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 the, the fact that um, essentially almost all mass shootings in in history have been perpetrated by by dudes. Um, there are a lot of sort of common threads there, and there are, there are much smarter people than me picking those out. Mm-hmm. Um, again, links in the show notes, but. That is that is toxic masculinity at its worst. That is that isn't just, oh, you know, ha ha, you get drunk, you party, you party hard, and somebody gets hurt. That's, you know, you you're isolated, uh, not just from other people but from yourself. You feel entitled uh, to things that you are not entitled to, or people that you are not entitled to. And that bubbles over. So what I say, entitlement, um, isolation, and risk. What do you think? Have I have we have we gotten there? Uh, I think so. I think it's a good springboard. I'm definitely going to need at least a season to think about it because. Um, Stay tuned for our toxic masculinity podcast next season. Yeah, because what the I understand the concept of it, but because I don't fully grasp. What baseline masculinity is? Spoilers. Talk some more put together person than I am. <laughs> because, because I don't uh, because I don't fully grasp what the baseline is. It's hard for me to pick out and define and, and clarify toxic masculinity. I mean, I have I have an understanding of it from working at a bar, but I mm-hmm. usually just chalk that off to somebody being an asshole. Less mm-hmm. less so that like oh it's because of toxic toxic masculinity it's like oh that person's like an entitled asshole it's mm-hmm. not, you uh, you work at a, a college bar right like you just see entitlement all over the place it's not I don't ascribe it to the generation it's just young people they're drunk or whatever and they think they're entitled to certain things and my job is a lot of times to enforce the fact that they are not entitled to certain things yeah um, so at present it's hard for me to talk about it with any kind of comprehension i'm gonna need at least a season to read and think and mull it over and and try to relate it to my own experiences to understand it but i think we have laid at least the basic groundwork to start that conversation yeah i suppose the 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 if this is our teaser for uh you know our exploration of us as men and our teaser for the uh upcoming you know, talk about the bad things of men and the bad and the, and the dark side of men. I mean, the 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 real conclusion that I would hope is drawn from it is, I have no interest in indicting men. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of them, and there's a lot of talk that goes around that. I mean, I do it a lot. None of it, none of, none of that gets pointed at me mm-hmm. uh, because I am a dude, mm-hmm. um, and that is how privilege works on the internet. But it isn't being a man that's being a problem. Mm. That, that is a problem. It's being entitled. Mm. Um, it is being, you know, isolated. Being isolated is a problem. Mm. Um, you know, it, it is not good. It does not make you feel good. And it is sort of... The, the, the risk thing is, is, is the culture of, of taking strange risks or um, feeling entitled to take risks with other people. And I think you see this in these three things in essentially any male-dominated structure from the military to startup culture to university culture is these are the three the three sort of orbiting factors. But let us know uh, in the comments. Uh, let us know if we missed something. Let us know... Uh, I'd be really intrigued to hear how 
um, if you're if you are a dude, how you uh, understand and exhibit your own masculinity, and if you are not, then how you understand other people's and, and the sort of things that you pick out. So we will see you next time. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. We're signing off. Stay awesome.